Good morning, European Disciples! My name is Colby Gray, and I bring you greetings from Edinburgh, Scotland! The title of charge I've been given is a spirit of learning in the ICCM. Let's please turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 4 in verse 18. The Bible says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. The Greek word here for to, to make is the word poieo, and it means to make, to construct, to form, to fashion. And Jesus, as we remember, was a carpenter. He made things with his hands. So I, I can imagine him saying, guys, guys, come with me, and I'm going to make you into disciples. I'm going to make you into fishers of men. Now, who were the first people that Jesus chose? Other working men just like himself. He didn't go to the academics. He didn't go to the intellectuals. He didn't go to the Pharisees. No, he went to the working class, blue-collar men just like him. I want to talk to you about another carpenter here today. His name is Jacob Steele, and he recently got baptized in Edinburgh, Scotland. See, Jacob, whenever he came out, he didn't believe in Jesus, not at all. But he did believe in Satan, because he was very heavily involved in drugs, alcohol, and witchcraft. See, he didn't know anything about Jesus. He didn't know anything about the Bible, but he knew everything about discipleship. And the reason why is he never went to university. He went straight away out of school and worked as an apprentice. And studying the Bible with Jacob taught me so much about the ICCM and what it should be and what Jesus' model is. It's not an intellectual, uh, theoretical type of learning. No, no. It's a hands-on, practical apprenticeship. See, I got my master's in 2019, and the ICCM master's is incredible, absolutely amazing. My favorite part by far was the search for the ancient order. It's a four-volume section on the history of the churches of Christ. And it's inspiring when you look at our history, where we come from, the men and women who came before us, and to be inspired by their example. We have the, uh, how we got the Bible. People ask, oh, the Bible was, was written by men. Oh, yeah, it was arbitrarily chosen. No, I can show you the facts. I can go back to the original documents, and I can prove to you that the Bible was not just randomly written by men, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, of course, the history of the church. There's so much in the ICCM. See, ICCM, and the reason why we need to have as many ICCMs as possible in Europe, is that there's nothing like it in the world. See, ICCM, it's less of a university and more of an apprenticeship. It's another way that we can distinguish our churches from all the other churches, from all the other Bible college, because truly to benefit from the ICCM, you have to put it into practice. And you see, this is what I learned whenever I went up to Scotland. Because when I got my master's in 2019, I thought that because I had a master's in ministry, that automatically made me a master of ministry. And that's not how it works. See, I had to learn a few more lessons whenever I went, specifically how much more I still have to learn. And that's what the ICCM is great at. It's great at teaching you how much you have to learn and that we need to be lifelong learners. See, for the banquet, the uh, ICCM gala, it was incredible. We were handed out these amazing bright red <laughs> university caps and they have on the back the name of the ICCM school. Now, what's incredible is that we have four radical, sold-out ICCM students in Edinburgh, Scotland. But the thing is, is that I was given 15 caps. So, the, the message was very clear. I got to get back on campus. I got to roll up my sleeves, put the real ICCM lessons into practice, and to get some more ICCM students to put in the school. So... Get your masters, get an ICCM in your city. Bonjour à tous et toutes, je m'appelle Cassidy Omos, j'ai le honneur de 
diriger l'église chrétienne internationale du Paris avec mon nom, Anthony Olmos. And it's not just Paris ICC, it's l'église chrétienne internationale du Paris en français, amen. And I have the honor to preach a spirit of true true humility before God's word. And I was baptized 11 years ago this Sunday, and I, I was not humble coming into the kingdom of God, unfortunately. Pride blinds us from seeing God's visions for our lives and even blinds us from having the dreams that God has for us. And I have a story about ICCM. When I was asked to be in ICCM, Kip goes, okay, introduce yourself, what church you're from, what your vision is. And people are like, I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to be a women's ministry leader. I'm going to be a world sector leader. And then it came to me, and I rise up. And I go, hello, I'm Cassidy Dees from the mighty IE region, and I want to go into the fashion industry. <laughs> Kip's face was exactly like Michael right now. And he gave me the Kip clap, and I sat down, and I was like, did I say something wrong? And I did because my insecurity blocked me from seeing what God's vision was for me. You see, in the Bible, Saul was blinded by pride. He was lacking humility and didn't have the ability to lead the people. Jezebel, lacking humility, didn't have the ability to be submissive. And Judas, lacking humility, didn't have the ability to see the true Messiah. But then you have those who were blinded by pride who changed. Amen. I changed. Amen. King David fell into sin but came back for the win. Paul the Apostle, who was a Christian killer and then became a Christian thriller. And then Rahab went from prostitute to prostrate before the Lord. And then, my sisters, you got to ask yourself, are you humble before God's word? You see, what are factors of false humility? Lack of integrity, you think you're being fully open, but you're not. You're enforcing your dreams that aren't God's dreams for your life. Wanting praise from leaders because in your own eyes, you're so humble. Look at me, I'm setting up the chairs, I'm so humble. I'm doing the leader's dishes, I'm so humble. I'm seeking advice, I'm so humble. Seek advice that is hum humble. Or people pleasing out of selfish ambition and not self-righteous, or not for God's righteousness. Or even hiding in the fellowship because you're afraid of failure. You don't want to be asked to do something but also lacking imitation because in your eyes, you're trying to look for a formula, wow. how to get there. And the last one, acting supportive when others are lifted up, but internally you're critical and judgmental. Ooh. You know, reasons for hus false humility is because you're insecure with your relationship with God. That's what makes us insecure in the yeah. fellowship and in our relationships. You know, Jesus didn't come down on earth looking for human affirmation. He was looking for human transformation. So are you transformed by the word of God, my sisters? In Luke 1, 37 and 38, an amazing woman who was humble before God's word was Mary, the mother of Jesus. She said, the scripture says, for no word from God will ever fail. And she responded, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. And the angel left her. You know, Mary was humble. Humility is measured by two factors, two things, faithful obedience and faithful action. Mary had this. She was faithful and she took action because faith literally means being persuaded to do God's will. Are you completely persuaded to obey and take action? Or are you, when you're called, just praying forever about it and not just responding? You know, you have to have the humility to obey and do it God's way. You know, you have to have humility to take action to get traction. So I'm calling all the European sisters. It is time to let go of your insecurity. It is time to stop thinking, oh, how am I going to get this? How am I going to imitate perfectly? You're never going to be perfect. We're not called to be perfect. And the scriptures say, knowledge puffs, puffs up while love builds up. And that's discipleship. That's imitation. And that's really to let go of all of this and let God use you, amen, and say, I am the Lord's servant, Mary Anson. May your word be fulfilled. I love you very much.
Amen. It is harder to preach to the European world sector. My favorite world sector of them all. A uh, very special welcome to Ignacio as well, who came here from Chile, just joined the GLC. Please wrap your arms around him. The title I have been given is A Spirit of Going Full Time. First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy 3 is about driving out false doctrine. I would like to start off by driving out some false doctrine from our hearts when it comes to being full time. The false doctrine goes like this. Not every Christian is full time. The last time I checked, there are no full time Christians and part time Christians in the Bible. Now some work 40 hours a week, a secular job, and have less time to work for the church, but there is no double standard. A full time Christian is the only type of Christian. It says in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, Here is a trustworthy saying, so trust me when I say, Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So if you want to be a church leader one day, you desire a noble task. The word for noble, kalos, can be translated as beautiful. Excellent, Come on. choice, Come on. surpassing, precious, commendable, admirable, praiseworthy, noble. Is that how you see the full-time ministry? Or do you see it as a grind? Wow. On, you see, the Holy Spirit considers it a noble thing to want to become a church leader. Do you agree with the Holy Spirit? Verses 2 to 7 show that you have to be a noble disciple if you aspire that noble task. And these are also the reasons why people don't go into the full-time ministry. Verse 2. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. Which means you got to find an awesome full-time ministry spouse. Amen. Amen. I mean, if you desire to be in the full-time ministry, you would never consider marrying somebody who doesn't have that aspiration, right? right. Just checking. <laughs> Temperate, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. How about we get to the real reason why people don't go full-time Greek? We use sophisticated terms like the American dream. Why we don't go full time, which really is a dream of greed. That doesn't only exist in America, it exists, it's common in Europe as well, amen? You see, you are materialistic and you want to live a comfortable life. That's why you don't want the full time ministry. First Timothy 5, chapter, verse 6 says, But the widow, and I believe this applies to every disciple who lives for pleasure, is dead, even while she lives. You see, if you want to have that noble task, you've got to be willing to live cheap and accept the reality you're never going to become rich. Are you willing to pay the price? You see, a spirit of going full time means being ready to make the sacrifices needed to go full time. And every single full-time person has done that. Michael and Michelle. They sold their house, they sold their cars, everything just to come to Europe and lead the European world sector. What is the result of that? You all are the result of that. You see, a spirit that's going full-time produces churches. Back in 2014, by the grace of God, I got to put myself full-time. I was working a full-time job. And with the money I was earning, I got to be in Riverside, California for six months, self-supporting. You see, we got to get rid of the expectation, show me the money, and then I'm happy to go full time. Where are the disciples in the European world sector who put themselves full time? We are the unpaid interns. We are the part-time interns who make it happen. Does somebody have to pay you for you to follow your dream? Galatians 6-7 says, do not be deceived. 
God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So if you sow in the full-time ministry, that is where you're going to be reap, uh, reaping the benefits. If you sow elsewhere, you will reap the benefits elsewhere. So sow in the full-time ministry. It takes sacrifice and saying no to other opportunities. You see, the European world sector has got to have the spirit of going full-time. We were overwhelmed by the amount of people who want to raise up and go full-time. It is better that everybody in the church wants to go full-time than for us not to have enough people who have the dream. As Moses said in Numbers 11, 29, I wish that all the lost people were prophets. I wish all the people were full-time for the church. In the restoration movement where we have our roots, the mission in the northern states in the U.S. failed. Why? They failed to produce the preachers necessary to get the job done. Are we going to let the history repeat itself because nobody learns? Are we going to let the mission in Europe fail simply because we don't have enough people who want to go full time for Christ? Let it never be said in the European world sector, we don't have enough people to get the job done, to desire that noble task. You see, there is a need in Europe for full time workers right now. We're only in six out of 44 countries in Europe. What will it take for you to go full time? Make it happen. Either you will find a way or you will find an excuse. Find a way, make it happen. Jesus made it happen. He had women supporting him out of their own means. Luke 8, 3. Paul made it happen. Acts 18, Paul and, Sil uh, Paul and uh, sorry, Silas and Timothy came. He got to uh, devote himself exclusively to preaching. He made it happen. So practically, at the end of this conference, present to Michael your plan of how you're going to go full time. Many times the calling of God comes to the man of God, Acts 17. So when you're being called to go full time, say yes. If you're not willing to go, to, uh, go full time, you should not have made it past the discipleship study. If you struggle with the thought of going full time, how about you go up to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are here and tell them how you struggle with that thought. Dear family, we have got the solution to Evangelist Europe in this very room. Let us have the spirit of going full time and make it happen. To God be all the glory. John chapter 12. The title that has been given to me is the spirit of massive generosity. My name is Sean Hurdy, and along with my incredible wife, we lead the West Region of the London Church. And I want to thank Michael and Michelle for giving me the opportunity to speak. A man said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. In the ministry of Jesus, we make a disciple by what we give. We produce a region by what we give. We give birth to a church by what we give. John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds, and the church says, a spirit of massive generosity is dying to oneself every single day. My one and only point, die to yourself. Die in the Greek, it comes from two words. The first word is apa. It means of separation. So when you die, you die from the life that you had to a new creation. So this doesn't just happen at baptism. It happens every single day. Jesus is calling you to be a new creation every single day. Jesus died to himself every single day. He was disfigured so we can be transfigured. In Matthew chapter 27 verse 50, it says Jesus gave up his spirit. Paul the Apostle died every single day. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it said he poured out his spirit. Question, what do you have to die to? What do you have to die to? Your pride? Your bitterness? Your laziness? Your skepticism? Your thinking? You know, we're, in, we're Europeans, amen? We struggle with overthinking. We have to die to that. Do you have to die to your wallet? Withholding financially from God and the kingdom of God. Do you have to die to your selfishness? 
What about to your glory? Are you willing to allow your ministry to de decrease so the European world sector can increase? Back in 20, uh, 2019, my wife and I, we had the opportunity to leave the East region. Now, we were sent to the West region for spiritual healing. So I'm so grateful for the West region, amen? But before we left, there was a guy I was studying the Bible with. And I poured my whole heart out to this guy. I, I, it was during COVID, so I went to his house, fasted for him, went over to, uh, gave him food, just did everything I could. And he didn't get baptized. Well, the same week I moved to the West region, this campus student started studying the Bible, and he got baptized that Sunday. And you know what? I received no glory. I received no praise. And God was saying, it's not your baptism, Sean. It's not your region, Sean. They're not your people, Sean. It's God's people. It's God's baptism. It's God's region. It's God's church. It's God's European world sector. What is God calling you to die to? He was calling me to die to my glory. Maybe God is calling you to die to your identity. Who you think you are. There are some of you that walk around saying that you're a loser. And you're, you can't win. You can't do it. Well, I'm here to say, die to that thought. Die to that thinking. Die to that identity. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. In closing, I'm inspired by our mother and father in the faith, Michael and Michelle Williamson. They are the very definition of massive generosity. They pour out their spirit, their heart. They die to themselves every single day. And that has produced six churches in Europe. But at the EMC, we will have seven churches in the European world sector. My practical. It was, it was to identify where you need to die, but you know where you need to die. Write it down and start dying and pouring out your spirit and watch God move in the European world sector. It's God be all the glory. Uh, my title for the charge is The Spirit of Total Forgiveness. And I love this quote my mom and the faith gave me. It goes like this. If you can remember that forgiveness is a gift that you sisters give to yourself and not to the other person, the process of forgiveness takes on an entirely new feeling. So my name is Vienna Shafadoumi and I want to give thanks to Mama Michelle and Dad Michael for this opportunity and for all your training and discipling. Uh, I'm baptized in 2016 together with my amazing husband. <laughs> and we planted Amsterdam in 2019-20 with a great team. The church has now grown uh, to 60, but we're pruned by God till 50. But I'm really with full confidence, Tom and I, leaving the church in the great capable hands of Frank and Janae Zimbalani. Well, we have the privilege with an amazing team to plan Germany, Berlin this year. God is really using my life in a powerful way because I'm a nobody. I'm not even from Amsterdam, a very tiny, small village in the east. My grandmother is actually German. <laughs> so that was a funny thing that God did. Um, but I really feel that I'm like a little child plucked, you know, somewhere, and then God just put me here. Uh, but I'm a huge sinner, and one of them is that I struggle with forgiveness, um, to be quick to overlook an offense. And I've cried many discipling times when I was a young disciple. Uh, I, I wouldn't be here without the help of the Gordines. And many times I cried with Hillary. <laughs> the help of the hearts, Michael and Maria, thank you so much. The help of the Bramats, uh, they're in Amsterdam. They're amazing. And also the Ochens and, and the Williamsons. Colossians 3, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, in the Living Translation, it says, Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. 
Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, as a little girl, I looked for recognition in pleasing my father. My dad was my trainer, so he was also my coach, my cheer, like cheering me on. So then when I didn't get praise, there was like an emptiness. Now, I have to learn to fill it with how much God loves me. And so I want to speak today about the recognition Solomon sought in his father, David. So if you can turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 14. And so it's all about how you're raised, because David was raised with the ba of the sheep. Amen? <laughs> David didn't get a lot of praise growing up. But Solomon, however, the Bible describes that he was praised for his looks. And he grew up in the kingship of his dad. Now, when I did something wrong, and again, sisters, for you, this might be discipling today, you know, when you get hurt. But when I did something wrong, it hurts me so much that at one point I didn't speak to my dad for seven months because there was something he disapproved or disliked, and it just hurt me so much. And I would have thoughts of like, I'm going to hurt you back. I'm going to, you know, out of the revenge, the grudges, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just not speak to you. You can, you know, you want it, you can have it. And I even have it till this day with my husband a lot. Like even during this conference, we were like this unified. And I'm like, you want to go this way? You can have it this way. <laughs> because guys, you must know me. I'm raised with judo fightings like five days, six days a week. I'm like, you want to fight? Bring it on. <laughs> In my heart. <laughs> but I want to speak today, sisters, to you that bitterness and holding grudges is a choice. And it's a choice against righteousness. And that's the difference between Solomon and David. So sisters, I want to convince you with this charge that you don't need the other brother or sister who sinned against you. You, you don't need them at all, period. You are the one that having the choice to let go. And so in Proverbs 19, verse 11, in Amplified, it says, Good sense and discretion makes a woman slow to anger, and it is his, her honor and glory to overlook transgression or an offense without seeking revenge and harboring resentment. Many say it's trust issues, but what does our dad in the face say? It's a forgiveness issue. So it's not if you're going to be discipled, it's when you're discipled, it hurts, right? No discipling seems pleasant at the time. But those who allow training, they will reap what? Righteousness. So Solomon had right intentions, just wrong actions. We as disciples, we have a right heart. It's not your identity that's under attack. You have the right heart, but we have wrong applications, right? And wrong actions, they're called sin, and we'll never be sinless. But you know what? You can be blameless if you walk in the light and allow discipling. Now, let me show you why David uh, was struggling to forgive Absalom. If you can turn to the scriptures in 2 Samuel verse 13, in verse 23, it talks about that two years after the event happened with Amnon and Tamar, only then Absalom kills his brother. Verse 38, it says three years after, this is five in total, he flees. 2 Samuel 14, I'm going to go a little bit quicker, guys. Uh, 2 Samuel 14 verse 28, it says two years after that. Now we're, okay, two plus three plus two is... <laughs> Are you guys with me? Seven? Um, then he comes back, but he doesn't speak to his dad. He still longs for his dad's recognition. Second Samuel verse 15, uh, sorry, chapter 15, verse 7, it says four years after. And only that's when he turns towards, like, take, wanting to take revenge with his father. This is 11 years of bitter, bitterness, resentment, and anger of not getting recognition. Imagine how long Satan must have whispered to Absalom. How long, sisters, have you not spoken to someone? What's the longest time you've held resentment to someone? And this is the thing we've got to do. In 2 Samuel 15, verse 30, David finally prays. I have not found any other moment between 2 Samuel 12 and 2 Samuel 15, 11 years of time, that David prayed. It is prayer and David's choice to choose righteousness and to get his heart soft to be able to forgive Absalom. It says in 2 Samuel 18, verse 31, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died 
instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And now David is able to love. Why? Because that is what a soft heart does. You can't love someone without God. You can even love your enemy right now if you get your heart soft before God. Bitterness comes from wanting to keep it all together when you shouldn't, sisters. God wants to touch your heart in prayer. Absalom chose the bitterness. It is from hostile because the Bible teaches us the flesh is hostile. There's hostility. So love and forgiveness is of God, and you can only find it in prayer. I love you, family. Sisters, let's have a spirit of total forgiveness, and to God be all the glory. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. My name is Poole Bissari. I'm with my beautiful wife, Rebecca Bissari. We are the evangelists and women's ministry leader of the Electric East region of the London International Christian Church. The title of my charge this morning, The Spirits of Abundant Fruitfulness. The Spirits of Abundant Fruitfulness. In John 15, in verse 1, it reads, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he trims or prunes, so that it will be more fruitful. Verse 4, remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Did you know? In the first ten verses of this passage, the word fruit appears six times. But the word remain appears nine times. What is Jesus calling us to focus on this morning? To remain. The word remain in Greek is meno. Not to depart, not to leave, to continue to be present. In the King James Version, it doesn't use the word remain, it uses the word abide. You only abide in something that's your abode, your home. I believe that we treat our relationship with God sometimes like a hotel and not like a home. It's not about occasional visitation, but about making Jesus your home. Fruitfulness, according to this passage, is not the goal. But the measurements of how well you are doing in your goal. What is the goal? Jesus is saying, remain in me. I put it before you. Abundant fruitfulness is a product of abundant faithfulness. How's your quiet time today? How's your quiet time this past GLC week? How's your quiet time this past month? This past year? How faithful have you been? Amen. Have you compromised in your worship? How on earth can you ask God, why am I not fruitful? If you're inconsistent in your prayer life. You know, the thing about nourishment is that it is very obvious. The thing about no malnourishment is that it's very obvious obvious. You walk around with no joy, no passion, no zeal, no energy, no reverence for God. I've come to believe a simple fact. A large part of discipleship is about making a decision, dare I say, gaining the conviction to remain. 
All throughout the Bible, you see it. Job, despite having all his wealth taken away, all ten kids killed on the same day, his health taken from him. And on top of that, an irreverent, contentious wife. Job had the conviction to remain. And what did it produce? In Job 42 verse 12, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. Joseph, despite being hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, years upon years in a town, a city that was not his own, a land that was not his own, all alone. Joseph had the conviction to remain. What did it produce? Genesis 50 verse 20, you intended to harm me. But God intended for the good to accomplish what is now being done the same of many lives, Jesus Christ. Betrayed by his top guys. Flogged, spat upon, treated like dirt. Jesus had the conviction to remain. What did it produce? Our eternal salvation. When your friends decide to fall away, remain. When people give up on the dream, remain. When you have issues in your marriage, remain. When you're not being recognized for your hard work, remain. When you feel alone and overwhelmed, remain. About five years ago, I was on the verge of falling away. I lived my first five years of discipleship compromising in my relationship with God. Everyone gave up on me, apart from one man, my father in the faith, my Courtney. I made a decision not to give up, yes. but to remain. On. on the 4th of February, Byron got baptized. On the 13th of February, Andrea got baptized. On the 6th of March, Lira got baptized. On the 27th of March, Mark got baptized. On the 4th of April, Steph, Roma, Steph Powers, Romaine Dixon, Obi Ahurugu got baptized. On the 17th of April, David got baptized. Michaela got baptized. On the 24th of April, Bruno got restored. On the 6th of May, Janelle got baptized. On the 3rd of May, Daniela got baptized. On the 19th of May, we smashed our special mission by 109%. On the 19th of June, Lem got baptized. 26th of June, Harry and Grace got baptized. On the 3rd of July, Mattis got baptized. On the 10th of July, Charlie got baptized. On the 7th of August, Dylan got baptized. And this weekend, Alexis is getting baptized. Next weekend, Charlie's been restored to the kingdom of God. The challenge is very simple. As the great church home once said, never give in, never give in. Never, never, never in anything, whether great or small, large or petty, never give in, except of conviction or honor and goodwill. Never, ever, ever give in. No matter what, I charge you, remain. Je m'appelle Anthony Omos. On est ici et on va parler dans son chose. Courage. My name is Anthony Olmos. We live in a time where men want to be women. Where women want to sacrifice their babies to the fires of hell. Where Satan wants to sexualize our children. Where suicide is the easy way out. Courage is not common in our day. But not so in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, courage counts. It's the only place it counts. On, because all other courage is for naught. Die for your country for nothing. Die for Islam for nothing. Die for Jesus and save the world. Yeah. Point number one, courage is captured. The Bible says in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, the following night the Lord stood near to Paul and he said, take courage as you have testi about, testified about me in Jerusalem. So, you must also testify in Rome. You know, we think that somebody can give you courage. That's not correct scripturally. 
I believe all the courage in all the world is in God's hands. And the Bible says, come and take it. Are you here today to take some courage? I said, are you here today to take some courage? We got to stop waiting for somebody to hand us some courage. Waiting for a sermon to change your life. Go to the hands of God and take it. You see, courage is not losing heart in the face of fear. You can be afraid and still be courageous. Any fearful people in the house? I'm right there with you. It's not about what you feel, it's about what you do. Courage is when the, everything was falling apart in the ICOC. But the Williamsons had the courage to stand their ground in Portland. Courage was when everything was falling apart in that little Paris church. And the Totos had the courage to stand their ground in Paris. Courage is when Yasmin's family said, we're going to disown you. We're going to kill you. When they said they're going to try and kidnap her. And she stood her ground and she said, I'm going into full-time ministry. Point number two, courage is contagious. Jesus led his disciples to where he was going, to the cross. He didn't push his disciples so that they would die. He didn't hurt them. He led them in the right direction. And we as leaders in the kingdom of God, we shouldn't push our disciples so they fall away. We should lead them to where we are going, and that is heaven. Can I get an amen on that? Because it was the Toto's courage that inspired the Paris church to stand its ground. And now we're almost 70 disciples in Paris, France. It was Yasmin's courage to go into the full-time ministry that inspired Jean to go into the full-time ministry. And now he's going to Warsaw, Poland. And it was the Williamsons who inspired the Olmoses to stand our ground, to go back to Paris where we already failed. Any failures in the house? We went back and now God is moving that church more than ever. Courage is a command. The Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 9, Have I not commanded you? I said, have I not commanded you? Do not be discouraged. For the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. Stop being discouraged. You come to the GLC, you turn into Beyonce, as my favorite preacher said. Say my name, say my name. You've been acting kind of shady in your preaching lately. You want to hear your name in all the sermons. And you get discouraged because he didn't say my name. We got some humble people over here and some prideful people pretending like they don't care. I see people falling in love with the lights of this stage. The lights of this stage have burned up mightier men than me and mightier women than in this room. Do not fall in love with the lights of this stage. Fall in love with your God. Stop overthinking. Stop being prideful. Stop being cowards. It's time for the European world sector to let loose. Has not command, God commanded you to be courageous and go? I said, has not God commanded you to be courageous and go? To to go to Berlin, to go to Brussels, to go to Dublin, to go to Geneva, to go to Barcelona, to go to Athens, to go to Rome, to go to Lisbon. Has he not commanded you to go into all of Europe and to the ends of the earth? I want to tell you something. If you're in this room, has not God commanded you? You think you, you, think you came here just to hear some good preaching? If you're American or wherever? You came here because God has commanded you to come to Europe. You got friends in the fellowship with European passports? Tell them to take courage and stop hiding from the call of God. Has not God commanded you? Go take courage. 
And let's take this world for God. for Anthony Armos, guys. He blew it out of the park. Now, my name is Frank Simulata, and uh, I have the honor and privilege to lead the mighty Birmingham Church. Yeah! And thank you so much, Mike and Michelle, for entrusting me with this lesson. The title of my lesson is simply, The Spirit of Gathering the Remnant. Yeah! Do you have any remnant in the house today? Ah, yeah! oh, remnant, don't be ashamed now, don't be ashamed. I said, do any remnant in the house today? Now, now, some of you guys are saying, Frank, why are you preaching a sermon, bro? You are not anywhere close to being a remnant. I know, guys, I have the same question as well. Let's turn the Bible to Jeremiah 23. Let's go to the Word of God, and I'll show you someone who's got the spirit of gathering the remnant. In 800 B.C., Joseph is sent into slavery in Egypt. He tells his family that God sent him there to be a remnant on earth. Later on, Israel becomes the fastest growing nation. At a time where even Egypt got afraid of Israel, they decided to enslave them. 566 BC, God used Zerubbabel and he stole the remnant as Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple of God, the church of God. 550 BC, in a time where Baal worship is the norm, God tells Elijah, I have 7,000 prophets who have not bowed down to Baal. In about 466 BC, on, Nehemiah prays, has a broken heart over the broken walls of Jerusalem. He gathers the remnant and in 52 days rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. In 33 AD, after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, Despite all the followers of Christ, only 120 remnants in the upper room, they became the kingdom of God with 3,000 baptisms and they evangelized the whole entire world. January 2007, Oliver Greenwood from East London. He forms what is called the London Remnant Group. Later on, joined by James and Deidre Morgan. They become key mission team members to the Edinburgh International Christian Church. In the same year, May 2007, the International Christian Church is born with the 42 remnant disciples from Portland. October 2010. Michael and Michelle Williamson plant the London International Christian Church. 2011, Anthony almost gets restored. He gives up everything, gets sent to London for training, and he replants the Paris International Christian Church. October 2012, Martin Teresa Scott they give up everything in Dublin, Ireland. They move all the way to London, and next year they're gonna become mission team members to the Dublin International Christian Church. I'm not done, guys. August 2013, Renee and Nita Vermont leave the Netherlands. They join London. They become key members and get appointed as shepherds in the Amsterdam International Christian Church. And family, Today, on 12th August 2022, God has gathered the remnant and we now stand at seven churches with over 400 sold-out baptized disciples in Europe. God has the spirit of gathering the remnant. Jeremiah 23, you guys there? I haven't been given the tea sign. Okay, amen. Jeremiah 23 verse 3 says, I myself will gather the remnant. God says, if you don't have the spirit, he's got the spirit. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them out. And will bring them back to the pasture where they'll be fruitful and increase in number. You see, God has always been gathering his remnant to rebuild and restore and repair the church of God. 
You know, I want to ask you today, do you have close personal relationships with the remnant? As you guys have seen, that most of the remnants are the ones who are actually leading the churches nowadays. They are our leaders today. You know, if it were not for the remnant, guys, I wouldn't have my salvation. If it were not for the remnant, we wouldn't have this conference today. If it were not for the remnant, I would not be married. My wife comes from the Amsterdam church. If not for the remnant, I'd be overweight, unemployed, stuck in Africa. That's what it would be me. But Michael and Michelle brought me in. They trained me, and they molded me, and they appointed me as an evangelist in the kingdom of God. It was a remnant that called me to give up everything and go into full-time ministry. And that's Anthony Amos. I challenge you guys. The spirit of getting the remnant is simply having the heart of having close relationships with your leaders because most of them are, of course, part of the remnant group. Uh, the spirit of getting the remnant is also willing to be the next generation of leaders. Make it personal because God made it personal. I love you and to God be all the glory. family from you guys. I'm really grateful for Michael and Michelle because you guys have fostered this in all of us yeah. and taught us time and time again and your love has been consistent. Um, and that is what I'm actually speaking about this afternoon is the spirit of radical love for the lost. And it really starts with the spirit of radical love for God and for this family. But um, Edinburgh going there it helped me to see that loving the lost was not enough. I had to have radical love for the lost. And radical isn't extreme, it's just consistent. I love the story about Peter walking on water. In Matthew 14 it says, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. And I love this scripture because it talks about Jesus calling someone to do something they've never done before. And uh, actually it was in Peter's heart to do, but it says that the waves were, uh, the boat was being buffeted by the waves. That word in the Greek is basinizo, uh, and it means to be tormented or to be tortured. And I think about the lost world that we live in, and so many women sat, sit in a tormented boat where the waves are just crashing over them every day. And they're too afraid to walk out into the water. But what helps them is when they see Jesus. And they see Jesus through our love. That's really what brings it to life. That's what brought it to life for me when I studied the Bible, is the love of the disciples. And uh, we can't let people's masks fool us. Uh, I think in Scotland, it's the, it's the highest drug-related death rate in all of Europe. So many women buffeted, tormented in the boat, and they need our help to get out. And when they start to walk out, it takes a lot of faith, right, for them. It's like when, during this story, it's like there is waves crashing all over. There was a storm going on. Who in their right mind would leave a boat? I mean, I don't know what you would do in the middle of a storm, but, but Peter saw that if he was going to be rescued, it was going to be through Jesus. And so when someone has that faith to start walking out of the boat, we got to see that and nurture it. we got to do whatever it takes. we got to provide that consistent love to show them it's safe. You can do this. Um, and what gives this person a radical faith is our love. And love is not a feeling. It's a command. And for us as women, we have to imitate Jesus and make that conscious decision to be obedient to the command to love on a daily basis. I think about Jesus, and this is not easy for him. I think sometimes we look and we're like, oh, it's probably really easy for Jesus to love people. No, he had to make, he was tempted in every way just as we are. He had to make it a conscious decision to do it every single day. So I want to ask you, sisters, a question that I had to ask myself. Are you a conscious Christian? Or do you have a concussion? Does someone have to remind you to love the lost on a daily basis? Do they have to remind you to be joyful on a daily basis? Do they have to remind you to have faith on a daily basis? As Christians, we need to make
make conscious decisions as Christian women of God. We need to make a conscious decision every day to love God, to love the family, to love the lost. And I want to quickly just share that this, this the title is The Spirit of uh, uh, the spirit of what? A radical love for the lost. This is the spirit of a radical love for the lost. This is not going to be natural. Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we got to pray for it daily to be able to make that conscious decision. And I quickly just want to share about Kiki and Victoria, who really did this with a woman that was studying the Bible and got baptized before we left. It wasn't anything extreme. They didn't throw her birthday parties and, you know, big, big, big events. It was just a conscious decision. Every day for two months, they treated this woman like she was already baptized. Sometimes we can hold our hearts back in fear, but they did it every day. It was a consistent love, quiet times, evangelism, means of the body, everything. But they did it consistently, and that's why God blessed it. I want to encourage the sisters this afternoon to make a daily decision, a conscious decision to study the Bible with the women that you're studying with like they're already baptized. Love you. Greetings from Warsaw. I have a privilege to serve as a lead evangelist in the Warsaw International Christian Church. And my title is Spirit in Discipleship Relationship. Spirit of Loyalty. And you know, discipleship is all about following. Uh, to be a disciple of Jesus, it's always learn how to follow. And how do you think? How, how it was to follow Jesus? Let's open the Bible. Mark 10, 32. Mark 10, 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed uh, were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We were going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered other to the chief priest and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him other to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. There Three days later, he will rise. We see here that Jesus leading the way. Sometimes we want to lead the way, but it's not our way. This is Jesus' way. And I can tell you, you are not a disciple if you're trying to follow your way, but not Jesus' way. And you know, this is example of leadership what we see in the Bible. This is model of leadership. That leader lead the way and disciples follow. And I can tell you, ICOC, the great ICOC church was full because they stopped, they rebelled against this model. But this is not we. And I want to put before you and this is not an option. If you a true disciple, you allow your leader lead your way. And we see here some disciples, they were astonished, but follow. Some, some people, other people, they afraid. And where are you now? You afraid or you astonished? Because it it's depends how much you trust God. Because if you trust God, you will be astonished to follow that way what God lead you. I never forget that moment when, when I came to Poland with um, uh, Nick, who asked me to help there to uh, establish the Mercy Project. I never forget this call from Michael. Bro, I have a good news to you. We start the church in Warsaw. Next week, we will have a... a we will have an inaugural service. You will be appointed and you will lead this church. Uh, can I ask you at least take my suit from London? You know, and interesting, from the beginning I was feeling, how can I start the church? I have nothing, I have no mission team, I have no song leader. I, I have like a bunch of sisters who came from the war. There was very emotional 
you know, like, and they crying every day. Because like, oh, you don't understand me. But, but this is what, what, what I have. And in this moment, I remember the scripture where I was reading my quiet time in the, in the Exodus, in the uh, chapter 4, when Moses says, God, what can I do to make people believe? He said, what you have in your hand? A staff. Use your staff. Use that you have. And this is getting fair that this group of people can make incredible things for God. And now we see, can see the sisters who came here, and they're incredible. They share in the faith. They're real disciples. They, they've studied the Bible. And you know, like, and God start, start working. Now from the beginning, uh, uh, Jason was two, two weeks after, uh, not Jason, uh, James Morgan. Uh, Nick and Denise, they stayed two months. They planned two weeks, but they stayed two months with war. So after, uh, after uh, Victor's came... <laughs> After this, Naomi was three months, three weeks. After this, Gustavo from Moscow came for three weeks. After this, uh, Sandra came from LA. And Rizzo and Sasha came from Moscow and got always given some people. And now we're so thankful that Paris Church sent us peace of their heart, John and Lisa to Warsaw to serve them. And you know, they should be ready to die for Jesus. And if we're not ready to die for Jesus, how we will follow him? You know, like, if we're not ready to go to another country, if we're not ready to change our job because our disciples call us to do, how we tell them that we are ready to die for Jesus? We will never die. And we always have a choice. All we are afraid and follow or we are afraid and not follow, or we, as a true disciples, astonish but follow Jesus' His way. Amen. Thank you. Good afternoon, Europe. Gen dobre, sisters. Um, my name is Sandra Smith, and I have the honor leading the incredible, zealous Warsaw women. And we have with us at the GLC, we have Lesia, Katia, Angelina, and Nadia all here. And I'm so grateful to be in your ministry. The title of my charge this afternoon is A Spirit of Unstoppable Discipline. So when we break this down, the dictionary definition is a vital strength, impossible to stop that's in complete obedience to God. Discipline doesn't make us a better disciple. Discipline makes us a disciple. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, the Bible reads, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. One of my closest friends from college in Iowa, uh, he is a three-time Iron Man National Championship. Champion. Champion. Uh, and so an Iron Man, just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, it's a 2.4 mile swim. It's about 3.9 kilometers. It's a 112 mile bike ride, 180 kilometers. And it's a full marathon, so 26.2 miles, 42 kilometers. So after he's won these three competitions, I started to ask him all these questions about like how he did it and what, like, what his diet looked like. And he told me, I asked him, I said, oh, do you drink like just a ton of water? And he's like, no, I can never drink water. I drink Mountain Dew and Coke. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, I can't wait. I can't have empty calories. I need to consume 5,000 calories a day. So he goes, I, everything that comes into my body needs to be like high calorie food items, high calorie drinks, because I need all of this because I burn so many calories. Um, and I was thinking like for the majority of us, this is super unwise, right? This would be a terrible, terrible diet. 
But so how do we discover exactly the diet that's right for us? The diet that God wants us to have. It's by having amazing personal quiet times. That's how we find out a personal plan that God has for us. I also asked him, I said, do you ever lose your breath during the race? Like during parts of the race, do you ever feel like you're out of breath? And he goes, no, if I lose my breath, I've already lost the race. So spirit, the word spirit in Hebrew is ruah, which means wind or breath. So have we lost our breath? Have we lost our spirit running aimlessly? Instead, my friend told me he uses his watch, and he goes off of calculations that him and his trainer have decided together. So it's all calculations game on his speed, his time. And I was thinking about as well, with the Bible, this is literally what tells us where we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do, be doing, what our mission is. So do we use the Bible so that we're not aimlessly running, so that we actually ignite the spirit within us? So I want to leave us with just two simple practicals. Protect your quiet times at all costs. They are the first and most important part of our day. Our dear sister, Brittany Underhill, she shared something with me that it's always stuck with me. She goes, when you do your quiet time, have a blank piece of paper next to you with a pen, and anything that comes into your mind, write it down. Any calls that you miss, any texts that you got to get back to, anything that even God puts on your heart, reach out to this person. Just jot it on this piece of paper. At the end of your quiet time, read through all of it and pray through all of it, and then start going through the list. And practical number two, pray through the task and pick to do the hardest thing first. The hardest thing is often the most important thing and the thing we least want to do. But commit ourselves to praying through, deciding what the hardest thing is, and committing to do that first. Sisters, let us be Isaiah 32, 8 women. Women who make noble plans, and by noble deeds we stand. I love you, family. Good afternoon to the mighty European World Sector Disciples. My name is Luke Snow and my wife and I get the privilege to lead our beloved North Region of the London International Christian Church. The title I have been given by the Holy Spirit is a spirit of liberating the remaining European nations. It was four years ago in this exact convention centre that God gave me the vision and the dream to be an evangelist in God's kingdom. And if I have one purpose today, it's to convince one of you to give up everything and sow your whole life out for Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. It says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But it is Christ that lives in me. I no longer live. But it is Christ that lives in me. I'm dead. Luke is dead. The atheist is dead. The drug addict is dead. The pornographic is dead. Dead. I died and Christ lives in me. You've got to understand. That you are dead and crucified with Christ Jesus lives in you. There is a commonality in the scriptures across the European churches. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul takes Timothy to travel to Europe, he allows him to denounce his Greek identity and get circumcised as a full grown man. They are then called by an unknown Macedonian vision to go into this place. And then Luke, the great physician, unnamed, joins the mission team. The only identification we have is him changing the pronouns to we, but never once mentions his name in the book of Acts. And of course we know who started the church in Rome. No, we don't. The only indication we have of that is Acts chapter 2 when it says visitors from Rome were there on the day of Pentecost. 
Rome was the most influential European city of the time with a million residents. And God chose those few unnamed people to start the church there. We know it was not a church influenced by Paul because he had never been there. And when Priscilla and Aquila traveled to, from Rome in Acts chapter 18, that was the first time they met Paul. They were already Christians. This was a church started by unnamed people. The spirit with which we are going to evangelize all of Europe is a spirit of unknown, unnamed, unmentioned, unprecedented, unadulterated boldness. Where it is not about your name, but only God Almighty's name being proclaimed throughout this lost world. There are 32 remaining nations in Europe that need evangelizing. Money is easy for God. And by the looks of the 200 people in this room, the issue isn't having enough people. The issue is having enough sold out disciples who are willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything for Jesus Christ without their name being mentioned. I don't want you to put your name down for a mission team today. I want you to put your life down. Put down your medical career. Put down your racism towards your own people. Put down your desire to be rich and comfortable. Put down your fear of your parents. Put down your name, your life, your plans and your dreams. You no longer live, but it is Christ that lives in you. Selfish ambition is shameless. And it will leave your worship flameless. The plans you have made for yourself are aimless. But the plans that the Lord has for you are eternal, they're endless. Trust me, if you deny the call of God, you'll be restless, sleepless, and peaceless. And when we go to heaven, you will be homeless. If we want to be the men and women who evangelize the remaining nations in Europe, we must be fearless, fameless, and okay with being nameless. So we can stand before our God in heaven, blameless. The practical is simple. Pick a country and enlist into God's army. Sign up for a mission team today. Liberate Europe and to God be all the glory.